Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Last week, we got started making a Hemingway-sensitive knurling tool from a kit. If you haven't seen that video, there will be a link to the playlist for this project down in the description. Today, we're going to work on the rest of the flat steel parts and try to make some more progress, so let's get started. Last week, we got started on the arms, and we did all of the drilling, boring, and reaming, and I said I was going to save the curved surfaces and do those later on the rotary table. However, there is one more set of features we can do here in the mill vise, and that is the notches on the back ends of the arms. To mill the notches in the arms, I am going to set up the part between the two vices again, but this time I'm only going to extend one parallel over onto the other vise, and I'm not going to clamp the second vise. I'm just using the fixed jaw to prevent the part from deflecting away from the cutter. Tap it down here with a piece of copper just to make sure that the parallels are tight and they don't move. And then I will find the edges of the part with the edge finder and find the center using the half function of the DRO. Now just to check and make sure that I picked this up correctly again, I have dialed to the coordinates of this hole and I'm running a quarter inch pin in the drill chuck through it and it passes without snagging the edges. So it looks like we've picked up the original coordinates accurately enough. I'm going to rough out this slot with a half inch corn cob roughing end mill and I'm just going to plunge down through the part initially and then mill to the side to take away most of the material. Now the actual radius in this corner is supposed to be three eighths of an inch but of course with a half inch end mill I'm only getting a quarter inch radius but I'm just roughing this out and I will come back with a three quarter inch end mill to actually put in the final radius and finish the cut across. But these little corn cob ruffers just do a beautiful job in steel. You can plow just about as fast as you want and they just shred the material. They don't bang, they don't deflect the part as much, they don't generate a ton of heat, and they don't generate big sharp chips. They just generate this uh, kind of little gritty chips that vacuum up very, very easily. I'll take a couple of passes here and go a little deeper. I am going to stay a little bit short of the final dimension because I'm leaving a rough edge there and we'll come back and clean that up with a finishing end mill. Now this is a high speed steel three quarter inch two flute end mill and I'm just going to plunge this in very carefully because it is an interrupted cut and it is hitting hard on that square corner. I don't want to chip anything. I don't want anything weird to happen. So I'm just using the quill and I'm just running it down gently. It's a nice sharp end mill, so things are going really well. Now I did hold it out towards me in Y, about 10 thou, so we are not cutting to the final dimension. We'll just take a measurement here after this cut with the micrometer, figure out how much we still have to go. Should be about 10 thou. And then we'll dial to the final dimension, plunge down, and traverse across to bring the part to size. See how we did? This should be 625 thou. And yeah, we're right on there. A couple tenths over. I'll take it. Now we just have one more part to do, and that should be easy. I can just pull this one out, put the other one in up against the stop, and make the same cuts. Now incidentally, when you're done and ready to clean up the mill, always take the cutter out. I had a situation once where I was just wiping up the mill with one hand while traversing the table over with the other, and I got my hand caught between the not spinning tool and the vise, and it was a bad day. I don't recommend it. Always take the tool out before you clean up the mill. Next up, let's work on the side plates. There are two pieces of stock provided for this, and the first step is to mill them to length. I'm setting them up in the vise here. You can see I'm using the second one as a spacer on the other side of the vise jaws just to make sure that the vise jaws stay level and get an even grip on the part. And I'll start by just cleaning up one end. I'm just using a four flute carbide end mill here and just making a nice pass, taking a little bit at a time until the end cleans up. Once that's done, I'll go ahead and swap it for the other part and I'll clean up one end of the second part as well. You can see I've got a stop on the vise jaw so I can put these back in in the same position. To bring this to the final dimension, I'll just flip it around, put the milled edge against the stop and then just whittle it down until we reach our target. I took one pass, got it cleaned up, took a measurement and then took the rest. And it looks like we hit the two and a half inches right on. 
of course we have two of these to do so i will just swap positions put the one that's finished over on the left and put the one that still needs to be milled on the right and i should be able to drive to exactly the same dimension on the dro and get the same results next up we need to mill a step in the ends of these plates to make room for the vertical guide plates for the knurling tool so i'll go ahead and set this up on higher parallels so it sticks out the top of the vice jaws so i have access and I'll find the edge with a half inch edge finder. Now, since I used a half inch edge finder and I'm using a half inch end mill, I can just take the zero position I got with the edge finder, dial in the width of the step, and I should be able to measure that directly without having to make any compensation for the cutter or the edge finder. So after touching off on the top, I'll just drop it the 3 16 of an inch, and then I'll pull back a few thousandths to leave some material for a cleanup pass, and we'll just start hogging this out. That vibration you're hearing is the buttons for the pneumatic drawbar. They're loose in the housing and they're sitting there vibrating. So I'm trying to figure out what this is. I'll speed the spindle up, try to change the frequency and see if we can get it to stop. I'm also playing with how fast I'm feeding just to try to find something that doesn't vibrate as much. And yeah, that's better. Now in this cut, I've got some pieces of my Quill DRO set up vibrating. I do have a screw that is just almost touching the casting, but again, just changing the frequency slightly by changing the Quill speed cleans that up so I don't hear it. I may have to do something about that. This should be close to the final width. I am holding it back about five thousandths of an inch so that I can come back and clean up the floor and the shoulder. So I did miscalculate. I only had about half a thou, but this is cleaning up the floor on this cut. And I'll just work my way over and clean up the shoulder to dimension. Let's see how close we got. This should be 3 16 of an inch, so it should be 0.1875. And it looks like we're just under 0.187, so like 0.1868. I think what actually happened here is that the material bowed. If you've ever worked with cold finished steel, you know that there are stresses built up in the top and bottom surfaces. And when I milled away the step, I released that tension, causing this to flex downward. Let's see if we can actually see that flex in the part. Just hold a parallel up to it. And yeah, we can definitely see the light through that. So that would have caused that portion of the part to rise back towards the shoulder, that's where I was measuring. That's why that ended up overshooting the dimension. We do need to put some holes in these parts, so I'm going to set up the parallels held back from the edge of the vise jaw so that they just catch the ways there on the right-hand side of the vise. And then I'll set the part up so that the distorted portion is not sitting on the parallels so that it will sit square in the vise. Set up the stop because we're going to do both parts here, and I need them to match. First up, we will do the holes in the top and bottom. These are the pivots for the arms. The top one is a quarter inch and we'll just drill through undersize and then come back with a reamer and bring the hole to size. I'm being very careful now to select the correct drills because I don't want to over drill one of these. And the hole in the bottom is three eighths of an inch and we'll ream that to size as well. To do the matching part, I'm going to place it in the vise face down. So the warped edge is up, so we don't have to compensate for that with the parallels. But the reason I'm doing it this way is so that if I have some kind of an issue with my coordinate system or my stop or registration, the holes will still align. Since I drilled the other part face up and I'm drilling this one face down, the upper left corner corresponds on both parts. So if there's a slight error in the position of one of these holes, they will still match and the pins will go through square. We just do the same thing here. We've got the 3 8 hole in the bottom, the quarter inch hole on the top, and then the plates both need some additional holes for the screws that go through to hold the assembly together. On the chuck side, we've got some countersunk holes for flathead screws. And I'm just going to sink those down far enough that the heads will sit just barely below flush. That looks good. And then we'll just clean up the burrs on the backside with the Noga rotary deburring tool. I've had people ask me why I always call out that this is a Noga tool, and it's because people ask. If I don't say something, I get a whole bunch of comments asking me what that tool was. 
The other plate has some threaded holes for those M6 screws that we just drilled the countersinks for and for some additional screws for the tool block holder. I believe those are M5. So we get those in, deburr this part as well. And that should be all the machining for the side plates, except for rounding the corners, which we'll do later. Next up are a couple of simple pieces, what they call the distance piece, which is basically the spacer in the center and the part that goes in the tool holder. These are both just simple rectangular parts. This one is curved on one end. We'll leave it long and round it later, and it needs to be squared up on the other. So we'll just make a quick pass across the end here and square that up. And then we'll grab the tool holder block and do exactly the same thing, except this one's not rounded, so we'll square it on both ends. Now, this doesn't need to be any particular length, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to square the ends, and then we'll center the holes in the side. We just have a couple of through holes with counter bores. We'll go ahead and push those holes through with the drill. No need to ream these. They're just centered with the DRO and pushed all the way through. And then for the counter bore, I'm just going to run in here with a 3 8 inch two flute end mill. I did check and the pilot hole isn't exactly the same size as the pilot on the piloted counter bores that I have, but I've got an end mill that's about the right size and will accommodate the head of the socket head cap screw. So I just pushed that down to the right length and that worked out great. That's going to be perfect. For the distance piece, we just have a couple of through holes. So I'll set this up on a parallel and then get the parallel out of the way so we won't hit it. I zeroed up on the smooth machined end there with the DRO and I'm just putting the holes in the center of the block. And then I left the other end long and we'll round that up later. Unfortunately, after I zeroed up with the DRO, I didn't actually drive to the Y coordinate zero. So as you can see, these holes are not centered. They're supposed to be offset to the left because the right hand end is gonna be rounded but they should be centered top to bottom. So I'm going to have to remake this part. I'll go find something in my scrap bin and just make another one off camera. I really do need a bin of shame to throw these things in. The last piece of flat bar stock in the pile is this 1 16th inch thick piece for the neural locking plates. There are two of these plates, but I'm going to go ahead and cut them in a single setup. I've laid the two parts out into this one piece of stock in such a way that I can mill them with the diameter cutters that I have on hand. And I'll just go ahead and start by drilling the holes. There's plenty of extra material on both ends of this stock and I'm just going to use the center section. This is a 90 degree countersink that I ground up on my D-bit grinder. And we'll just use this to countersink these holes for M3 flathead screws. I just want to press these down in far enough to submerge the head of the screw so that it's flush or slightly below flush. And that looks about right to me. Let's try it with a screw. And yeah, that looks great. There is a little burr around the edge. I'll take care of that later. Go ahead and countersink the second one. My plan is to keep these two parts stuck together in the one piece of stock as long as possible for a couple of reasons. One, they're really small and hard to hang on to. And two, there's only one hole. So if I want to mount this in a way that it's not just going to spin out of the way of the cutter, I really need to keep it together so I have two mounting holes. So I just grabbed a piece of steel stock here and I'm going to drill and tap two M3 holes the right distance apart so that I can mount the piece of stock down onto this as a fixture. Just power tap these M3. And I've had no trouble power tapping with this mill down to M3. I haven't tried anything smaller than that yet, but uh, I think that would start to get pretty sketchy. I'll go ahead and add some chamfers to the top of these holes. This will just give the head of the screw some place to go if part of it extends down below the countersink in the thin stock. And then we'll just go ahead and screw down the part onto the fixture. We'll get these nice and tight, I think M3 screws are going to be strong enough to hold this, but we're about to find out. We've got the end mill set about 10 thou below the edge of the stock, so it's going to cut into the fixture. I wasn't really sure how this was going to behave, but it sounds good. Let's go ahead and take a nice meaty cut here and get this part down to size.
And that seems to be going really well. Those M3 screws in steel are pretty tough. We'll just go around the perimeter and make a couple of passes around and get this down to the final dimensions. The way I have this mounted, the ends of the double part is where the rounded ends of the plates are going to be. And the beveled ends with the thin blades are oriented towards the center. So we'll come back and thin those blades down using a quarter inch end mill. I oriented the parts in the stock such that a quarter inch end mill would cut the blades the right length. We'll just touch off, lower a 32nd of an inch, and make a pass across. This should remove exactly half of the material and leave both blades the correct length once we separate them. Seems to be going pretty smoothly, and... Yeah, that's where the camera quit. What follows is a dramatic reenactment based on actual events. You can see here what the parts look like when they're actually done here on the fixture. And you can see that I had these set up so that a quarter inch end mill would exactly cut these blades down to thickness and leave them at the correct length. In case it isn't obvious, those are M3 screws. So these parts are pretty small. To cut the chamfers, I used a 45 degree carbide chamfer mill. I just brought it down, touched off on the surface of the blade, raised it one thousandth of an inch, and just started taking passes equally on each side until the chamfers looked about right. I had to use magnification to see them, but I just brought them down until they met in the correct place. And then I came back with an eighth inch carbide end mill and separated the two pieces. And again, I had these positions such that an eighth inch end mill would be exactly the right width and leave those blades the correct length. I was a little bit worried that as I broke out on the end of the cut, they would rotate, but I was pretty sure they wouldn't rotate into the cutter and it worked. They didn't go anywhere. Let's take them off the fixture and see how we did. And yeah, I do know I have big hands, but they're not that big. These really are small parts. It always amazes me when you can do really fine work like this on a large machine. I will bevel the edges of those blades with some needle files and round the back. I'm not sure yet if I'm going to make a filing fixture or just do it freehand with some needle files, but a little bit of handwork on these and they'll be done. Let me grab a micrometer and see how thick those blades are. They need to fit into a 32nd of an inch slot, which will be about 31 and a quarter thou. And it looks like they're about 30 thou, so that should be a good fit. I do like making big parts on big machines, but these were really fun. I haven't actually done anything this small on a machine this size before, and I really enjoyed the challenge. This is easily my favorite part of this project so far. I think that's most of the straightforward mill work done. We still need to set up the rotary table so we can mill all of the round ends and curved surfaces on the parts we've already made. And we have a bunch of parts to make over on the lathe. And we'll continue working on that in a future video. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel, and maybe consider supporting me over on Patreon. If you didn't like this video and you stopped watching a long time ago, you probably shouldn't do those things. Thank you for watching.